How's it going, Yankee fans? Welcome back to Fireside Yankees with your boys, Alex and Ryan. Today, we're discussing a mock trade with the Minnesota Twins to fill the vacant left field spot. Of course, we know Andrew Benintendi, Michael Conforto, a couple options on the free agency market, but their price tags are rising as the number of players available is shrinking. So the Yankees kind of in an interesting spot. Maybe they want to reduce the salary hit. Maybe they want to allocate more money towards a guy like Carlos Rodon. And with that being said, reduce kind of how much they were planning to invest in left field. Of course, you still have Aaron Hicks on the roster, still got Oswald, Oswaldo Cabrera. So a couple options there, but I'd rather upgrade that significantly and offer some more power. Um, which is where Max Kepler from the Minnesota Twins comes into play. Now, Joel Sherman of the New York Post reported that the Yankees had been connected with the Arizona Diamondbacks and Twins um, about a prospective trade regarding some of their outfielders. So Kepler makes the most sense. We're going to tell you why. We're going to give you a mock trade as to what makes sense for both parties. Um, Max Kepler has two years left on his deal, the last year being a club option with a $1 million buyout. So the Yankees have a little bit of leverage there. Um, I think it's about $10 million, so extremely affordable, especially if they can turn him around. Um, defensively, absolute star. Um, you look at his offensive metrics. We're going to tell you why he could be a perfect fit for the Yankees and how he could kind of resurrect um, his offensive contributions, which have diminished in terms of his power over the past couple of years. Hit like, what, 32 homers a couple of seasons ago? And then he kind of dipped down to nine or 36 homers, maybe dipped down to nine um, this past year, 2022, which obviously is not normal for him. But we're going to tell you kind of why that happened and how that could translate to Yankee Stadium. So, Ryan, before we dive into it, how do you today, my friend? I'm doing great. Uh, you know, I look at a guy like Max Kepler, and I know that there are some, you know, kind of when you look at the surface stats, kind of, uh, you know, looking at batting average on base percentage, it doesn't look great. And it kind of harks back to when we're talking about a left handed corner outfielder, uh, a prior experience with Joey Gallo, right? Another guy who struggled with his batting average. Uh, but I, I think there are some key differences between Gallo and Kepler that, you know, uh, would mean that they haven't really struggled in the same sense. Kepler is not a high strikeout guy, he's maintained and a career strikeout percentage of 17.9% last season. Probably his worst year uh, over the last, really it's his worst WRC plus since 2017. Uh, he struck out his, especially for today's game, but he's got great, like his home run numbers are down, but he's maintained great exit velocity numbers. If you look at his max exit velocity of 113.8 miles an hour, here's some guys who kind of sit around that range. You have Sean Murphy at 114. You have uh, Nelson. Cruz Cruz at 113.8, Rafael Devers at 113.7, Anthony Rizzo at 113.3, Juan Soto at 113.2. You know, he's sitting in this range. He's in the 93rd percentile in that regard, right? So in terms of hammering the baseball, he does a very good job uh, of hitting the ball very hard. And, and, and if you get just in terms of average exit velocity, you know, yes, it's a little bit lower. It's at 89.1 miles an hour compared to, which is just in the 51st percentile. But there is home run potential here. There is a potential for him to go out and club 36 home runs, as you mentioned, where, what, what he hit in 2019. The balls were juiced that year, which I know is going to play a factor. But, you know, you take a guy and, and you can even get 20 to 25 home run power with, uh, you know, no shift, no shift next year. He's a guy who gets shifted, you know, roughly 90% of the time. He's a guy who's going to provide you a high floor to his defense. You mentioned his defensive uh, prowess in the outfield. He is one of the best defensive outfielders in the sport. 48 defensive runs saved, 58 outs above average in his career. This is an elite, elite defender. This guy could go down, you know, he's only 29 years old. He can go out and, and maybe put up 100 outs above average in his career, be one of the rare guys to get to that mark or get to uh, close to 100 defensive runs saved. These are marks that make you a high floor player. When you play great defense, it's a hard, you can't be, you know, it's hard for you to be a just completely terrible, right? Um, you know, if he goes out and you 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 acquire him and his I would say his his, his most likely outcome is probably being a 110 to 115 WRC plus hitter. It's not that far off from what you were gonna get from Benatendi. It's not that far off from what you might get from Conforto. It's not too far off what you might get from Brantley, considering Brantley's kind of hitting an aging curve, and he plays the best defense out of those guys, and it's not even close. And in terms of being a base runner, his sprint speed, it's in the 64th percentile. Last season, he didn't do great stealing bases. He was three for five, but in the previous season, he was 10 for 10 with stolen bases in 121 games. Bigger bases, a more aggressive base running team than the New York Yankees. The Yankees run the bases a lot more now. They, they attempt a ton of steals now. It's not really Minnesota style. Minnesota's not the type of team you know, to attempt, you know, in the top 10 or top five uh, in stolen bases necessarily. Not saying that they're a slow team, but that's not necessarily their style of baseball. Um, <laughs> and Max Kepler can greatly benefit 
uh, from bigger bases. He seems like someone who's just going to get a lot better with these new rule changes and adjusted shift. And then Yankee Stadium, right field, he's a big fly ball hitter. I think he should be pulling more of his fly balls. If you're going to be a fly ball hitter, you're going to hit for a low average. Your bat pips are, the bat pip on fly balls are lower than ground balls and line drives. You know, batters recognize this, teams ex- recognize this, organizations recognize this. But if you're able to pull a lot of them, you'll turn a lot of them into pulled barrels or pulled fly balls. Those will convert into more home runs. So, Sure, you can hit 230, but Anthony Rizzo hit 223 last year. 133 WRC plus, one of the Yankees' best hitters, not just in the regular season, but in the postseason as well. So you can have a low batting average, a high high fly ball percentage, you know, be a home run walk guy. Um, And he just profiles very similar to Rizzo. Lots of fly balls, left-handed, pull happy, doesn't strike out a lot, works a lot of walks, great defensive player. If you put this guy in the fifth or sixth spot in your lineup, you're going to feel pretty good about how deep your lineup is. And you get another lefty who has pretty good contact skills into into the fold. Yeah, look, and and kind of the main variable here for the Yankees looking at Max Kepler is defense. You know it's great. You know you're getting a great defensive player. Now, the offense is a lot left to be desired. You look at, you know, hitting coach Dylan Lawson, what he's done for some of these players. Uh, a lefty bat. This is what we're looking for in left field. The lefty bat with some power, maybe some untapped power. Um, and, and, you know, the interesting thing is a lot of these homers that he hit um, with Minnesota – are, are there's even more, you know, if you look at the 36 homers he hit with Minnesota in their stadium back in 2019, he would have hit 41 in Yankee stadium last year. He hit nine, he would have hit 14 in Yankee stadium. So you're seeing just the stadium alone is going to, is going to produce more home runs for Max Kepler. As you mentioned, banning of the shift opens up a massive opportunity for guys like Rizzo guys like Kepler, these left players like Ben and even. Um, so, you know, you're looking at a player who has a lot of potential offensively. If the Yankees can maximize that, get, the most out of him you're in a really good spot and if he doesn't pan out you move on you got Oswald to go Barry. you could fill that role um you know tr- kind of just go through a cycle Hicks just play the hot hand see who's kind of getting uh the best option or the best opportunities and, and taking advantage of them um in the batter's box but you know, his the thing about his home run totals is that his power never really diminished um you know back in 2009 you saw a 41.7 percent hard hit rate 8.4 barrel rate at 89.7 exit vol- mile per hour exit velocity those numbers haven't been taking significant steps backward. He's just not hitting as many home runs. It could be a launch angle for all we know. It could just be that simple metric where the Yankees try, you know what, hit those strikes hard. We want you to get a little bit more angle on that swing. And he's going to start hitting more home runs again. Like you mentioned, the, the juice balls in 2019 definitely plays a part. But there's no reason for Max Kepler not to be able to hit, uh, you know, 20 homers a season. There's just no reason um, aside from just poor coaching or poor, you know, just not utilizing correctly. Maybe it's just in his own head. Maybe it's just confidence-based. Um, so it could be a myriad of different things, but I think that Kepler has a ton of untapped potential. Um, and he's only 29 years old. He's super ripe, right? He's in the prime of his career. This is where the Yankees want to take a shot on a guy at a low cost. So that brings us to the next like, kind of element of this segment is what would we have to give up for Max Kepler? Now, Ryan came up with a pretty good mock uh, trade scenario. I don't. I would be willing to do this. I would love to hear your guys' opinions in the YouTube comments if you'd be willing to do this. So essentially, it's Max Kepler in his two-year deal. Um, he was on a five-year $35 million deal. He's set to earn $8.5 million in base salary this upcoming season. Team has a club option at $10 million for 2024. Um, with an, with a $1 million buyout if he doesn't pan out in 2023. So, you know, they have an out if they want to take it and they can keep him at an extremely price efficient point. Um, you know, this is a guy who I think may be a little bit more, I don't know, maybe a little bit better than Joey Gallo. He's a lot better of a defensive player. I'd say, I think we kind of referenced that before, but the two players that the Yankees would have to give up in this scenario is Domingo Herman and Lucas Lickie. So Domingo Herman, kind of a supplemental starting pitching arm. He's going to help mitigate fatigue for guys like Montas, like Sevy, like Nestor Cortez. Um, you know, we still expect the Yankees to make a splash um, in the starting free in the starting uh, pitching market. So whether that is Carlos Rodon or Nathan Eovaldi, um, hopefully Rodon in that in that instance. But her mom would really just be supplementing innings. He only pitched what seventy two point one innings, three six one ERA. So he wasn't bad, but he's an innings eater. He's not a guy that you're going to be utilizing in the rotation um, every single every single week. He's someone they're going to use to kind of take the workload off. But that's why we have Clark Schmidt, right? Clark Schmidt is expected to take a much bigger role in that specific instance and, you know, helping to mitigate fatigue down the stretch and for the playoffs. So I think he's going to play a big role. I would not be surprised if he pitched 80, 90 innings um, this next upcoming season to really help out guys like Sevy, like Nestor. I mean, Garrett Cole's kind of fine. Even Rodone, who's had longevity issues in the past. And Lucas Lickie's more of a, you know, low leverage lefty arm. He's been pretty good for the Yankees, 267 ERA, 83% left on base right 
over 57.1 innings this past season. He has two seasons consecutive of sub three ERA pitching. So, you know, he's actually been pretty solid, but he's a low leverage guy. You're really u- utilizing him when the Yankees are up by a lot or they're down by a lot, or, you know, they're just trying to get through a couple middle innings. If the starting pitcher gets knocked out early, um, you know, this is a player who is valuable in specific scenarios, but you know, there's a reason we didn't really use him in the playoffs. There's a reason you don't use him in high leverage moments. So I think that he's replaceable. I think the Yankees could probably find a guy, maybe whether it's a prospect or, you know, maybe just someone that they trade for or someone they pick up off the free agent market. Who's really, really cheap, a little bit older, has some decent numbers, can serve a specific purpose. Um, and I think they can replace him pretty easily, but Ryan, what are your thoughts on, you know, the package you came up with and Domingo Herman and Lucas Licky? Why do those two make sense in exchange for Kepler? Yeah, so, you know, just looking at how the bullpen's configured right now, you mentioned it with Clark Schmidt. Clark Schmidt kind of fills that role that, you know, uh, Herman has filled or it was projected to fill. Uh, you know, the Yankees are I, – I, I do believe the Yankees end up signing Rodon, uh, so I'm confident in that regard. And I, I guess a lot of this plan conti- it, it hinges on that signing. Uh, but, you know, if the Yankees have Clark Schmidt. You know, Herman's out of options. You can't option him up and down with Schmidt. You can still option him up and down if he were to struggle, uh, which I think is an important piece here. You know, if the, if you, even if you're looking at the bullpen, how confident are we that Herman's a better reliever than Clark Schmidt is? I don't think you can really argue Herman's that much better if he is a better reliever. I, I, I don't think he is a better reliever. I think Schmidt is a better reliever there. Um, and then you look at this, just the rest of the Yankee bullpen. King, Marnasio, Trevino, uh, Peralta, Canley, Loisica, Holmes, right? There's where's where is where is Domingo Herman gonna even fit? Um, you know, if where is Domingo Herman gonna fit if the Yankees sign Carlos Rodon? He would have to get, you know, released. The Yankees would have to release him. They have to get rid of him uh somehow, or they have to move him to the bullpen and send down Clark Schmidt, which would be a waste of Clark Schmidt because he's you know, he's turning 27. He's not a young prospect anymore. He's kind of graduating into being an MLB regular. Uh, and then you have other bullpen guys on the team who you're trying to figure out their roster spots. Lucas Litke, Albert Abreu, you know, these are guys who are also out of options and are actually quality major league relievers, right? You can say that maybe Abreu is a little volatile, but are you going to argue against the idea that Lucas Litke hasn't been a staple for the back end of the Yankee bullpen over the past two years? Throws a lot of innings, has been effective in that regard, right? Are we going to take Litke out of that for Herman? I-, I feel like it doesn't really make sense for this team. Um, and, you know, that's assuming Luke Litke even has a spot because if the Yankees would like to keep a six starter on the roster at all times, as you mentioned, you know, you never know when a starter gets knocked out early. You're going to need to roster Clark Schmidt. So you, you, you're in a, a lot of limbo with your bullpen. This is a good problem to have. I want to clarify. The Yankees are trading out of a position of strength here. They're trading their their start their seventh best starting pitcher if they sign Rodon or even if they sign Evaldi. Uh, and they're trading a reliever who doesn't have a spot on the roster. Uh, that that's the reality of the situation. Um, you know, this isn't even, uh, you could throw a Bray in this deal as well, if you'd like to, and it still wouldn't really do anything to affect the Yankees or phase the Yankees, because that's a guy they're also going to have to move off of most likely. Uh, this team is stacked pitching wise, right? Like Holmes, Liza, Canley, Peralta, Trevino, Marinasio, King, like that's seven guys right there. You carry eight relievers. Those seven guys are going to be on the opening day roster. There's no doubt about it. And those seven guys are are some of the best relievers in baseball. So you really only have one spot remaining. That spot's going to go to Clark Schmidt. The Yankees are trading up. And the, the Twins are not a very good pitching team. The Twins have struggled with pitching for a very long time. Uh, you know, they're, they they need pitching. They could you, Maybe you can say that they you can argue they need a better starter than Herman. Uh, and I, I would agree with that argument, maybe. But, I mean, this team doesn't really have that much starting pitching depth. They rely on a lot of guys who don't throw a lot of innings. They, they're going to need just bodies to fill in spots for their pitching staff. Uh, and you know, I think like, he gets uh, underrated in a lot of conversations. You know, people are like, how you know, people are probably going to think to themselves, how can a reliever and Domingo Herman get you Max Kepler if he's so good, or if, you know, you're talking him up this much? Lucas Litke has has been a sub three ERA reliever and has thrown a lot of innings, and I think that's valuable. And he's also got a guy with a curveball, which means he's effective versus his right handed hitting as well. The the tw- he's also got like four years of control, three years of control, something around that regard. So you know, these are two guys who have five years of combined control for Kepler, who only has one guaranteed year of control. The Yankees end up rejecting the club offer if things go south. So uh, the way I see it is the Yankees are giving up good enough value for Kepler and the twins are getting enough for Kepler. So I don't think this is something where we're just throwing, you know, bad players or players we don't want and giving them to the twins and getting a player we want. I think that the twins are getting something of need and the Yankees are trading just out of a position of strength. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's completely reasonable. Um, you know, if, if both sides can benefit, that's obviously the ideal goal of a trade. So ho- hopefully, you know, this is a realistic option for them and Kepler, you know, it, it obviously seems to be a fit for the Yankees, what they try to do a lefty bat, really good defense, some untapped power that they haven't been able to extract over the past couple of seasons. So I'm curious to see what you guys think about 
this specific trade in the YouTube comments. Always happy to hear perspectives and opinions. And make sure to enjoy the rest of your day. Like and subscribe as always. And we'll catch you guys on the next Fireside Yankees episode. Thank mm-hmm. you.